Why grace is a secret missing ingredient to unlimited fulfillment. So just a recap of the five virtues. This is what we've been going over the last few weeks. We start with trust, and then we move on to being honest and having grace and accountability and sexual integrity. So you can kind of see how in just a very short period of time, even a day or even one conversation, you can take yourself up this ladder through practicing having the courage to be honest with yourself and with somebody and receiving grace and that unconditional acceptance that we want, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And then having accountability to have your actions match your words and your values. And that is when you have sexual integrity. In plain terms, this is what it means to live at high noon, right? So the big old question that we all have about grace is why is grace the secret missing ingredient? I made this big proclamation that it's the secret missing ingredient to your fulfillment in life. And I promise you that if you really take to heart what I'm going to share about grace, it will radically change your life. I guarantee it. And I know that's a big promise to make. And I purposely set the bar for myself like that because I want to exceed that expectation if I can, right? Another question is, what is the cost of not prioritizing grace in our lives? Like, what is the actual cost of it? And how is it negatively impacting ourselves if we don't prioritize grace? Because the reality is we don't walk around every day thinking like, oh, I need some more grace today. I think I need more grace. Most people don't, right? And I'm willing to bet a lot of us, a lot of you guys don't think like that. It's more of something that we feel like we need when we've really made mistakes and we really feel the shame of our actions or we're just feeling the slumps. But why is it important to prioritize every day? How do I shift my behavior to experience more grace in my life? How do I shift from, oh, grace is not that much of a priority to, wow, this is truly important and I want to shift my behavior so that it matches the importance that I place on it. My goal, it's really simple. Change an old belief, which is grace is not that important. It's too difficult. It's too abstract. It's too vague. It's not much of a priority to me. Two, I really, really want grace and it's totally possible for me. Transparently, that's what I hope to give to you guys. Let's first agree that we all have unwanted behaviors, okay? We all have, to some extent, some kind of addictive behavior that is unwanted and that we keep going back to when we feel experiences like stress, anxiety, boredom, loneliness, depression, all those things. And that could be porn, masturbation, anger, self-loathing, food, substance abuse, excessive media use like social media, anime, video games, right? You get the drill. We all have unwanted behavior. So let's eliminate the shame that's associated with trying to receive grace and trying to live at high noon because we all have it and we all need to some extent, to some degree, we all have behaviors that we don't want. So have you ever wondered why you keep going back to an unwanted behavior, even though it causes you so much pain? Think about that for a second, even though it causes pain. And do you feel there's something missing? Like you kind of feel empty in your life sometimes. And do you wonder how you can keep the good feelings, the good vibes of being full and alive consistently through your life? Next, establish why people fundamentally use porn. We're going to use porn as an example because this is a very, very prevalent and good example to extrapolate to any type of behavior or addiction or bad habit, whatever you want to call it. So it's very easy for us to understand, even though people don't want to use porn. As people that have high moral values and beliefs and ideals for ourselves, why is it that we continue to do things that we don't want in our lives? So the reason that most people say when they start this journey of quitting porn and masturbation, they say, I use porn because I have a high sex drive. Now, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is usually in the beginning stages. They believe that it's because porn, masturbation is sexual in nature. However, what we don't understand is that if it was just a sex drive thing, then guess what? People who are in healthy sexual relationships would not struggle with porn masturbation. Is that true? Absolutely not. There are so many, so many people that are married in sexual relationships that struggle with crippling addictions to porn masturbation. So we can ride that off right now as being the primary reason that people use to go back to a habit that they don't want. It's not a sex drive thing. Tip of the iceberg. And then they say, well, it's because I don't have enough willpower. And this is the whole idea behind the NoFap community. If I just push through for 30 days, 90 days, 365 days, and just willpower, eventually I'll just get it. Eventually I just won't want it anymore. If it was a willpower issue, guess who would not struggle with addiction? Athletes, people who operate in the highest level of society, who have the most willpower would just not struggle with porn masturbation. We know that's not true because tons of athletes struggle with willpower. Tiger Woods does not lack willpower. Michael Phelps does not lack willpower. So we can write that off as the primary reason that people have an addiction or an unwanted behavior, even though they want it. So tip of the iceberg. And then they say, oh, it's spiritual factors. Who's been there? If I just pray on my knees, repent more, ask for forgiveness and do hunoke in scripture enough or go to champion, whatever, then I won't have this habit because it's a spiritual factor. I'm telling you guys right now, all of these are factors. Yes, 100%. But they make up a very, very small percentage of the actual issue going on. Because if it was a spiritual factor and just a spiritual factor, guess who would not struggle with porn and masturbation? People who are spiritual leaders. We also know that's not true. So what's actually going on? What's the under the iceberg, beneath the iceberg reason that people do stuff that it causes them pain they don't want? You got it. Porn is an escape. That's it. That is fundamentally why people do stuff. 
is because it's a very, very easy escape. Porn just happens to be the best escape imaginable. Imagine for a second that you made a drug that was completely free, easily accessible, hyper-stimulating, super normal, and you could have it in three clicks of a finger and no one would ever know that you used it. And it left no physical ramifications or damage to your body. And it wouldn't leave no sense or anything like that. How many people would be addicted to that? Most people. Like an example, you took your phone and then shook it and then cocaine fell out of your phone. Imagine how many people would be addicted to cocaine. A lot of people. Most people probably. Definitely more than right now. And this is important. The reason it's important to understand that porn is an escape is because when you understand that any unwanted behavior is just an escape, then you can quickly eliminate the shame associated with the behavior. Because everyone that I talk to that has a porn addiction or any kind of addiction, the shame that is associated with it is so heavy that it causes them fundamentally to want to escape and run away and feel like I'm a piece of garbage. I am unworthy. And the only reason I have this habit is because I'm a high sex driver person or I'm the devil's on my shoulder and crouching on my doorstep. And that's the reason, the spiritual factors. Or they say, oh, because I don't have enough willpower. I just don't have enough determination. These are all slight reasons, but that's not the real issue. So when you eliminate the fact and you understand the fact that it's an escape, then you can eliminate the shame associated with it. I can tell you guys with confidence, I've talked with grown men multiple times where I just looked at them and I told them, you do not have a porn problem. You don't. Stop thinking of yourself as some disgusting, hypocritical fiend of a sexual perverted human being, a freak of nature, because that's the shame associated with porn is causing you to feel. You're not weird. You're just in pain like everyone. And you have just found the best escape imaginable. That's it. That's it. Yes, there are other factors that contribute. Yes, I'm not going to discredit that. But the reason you found this is that you found the best escape imaginable. Is this making sense? So let's eliminate that as the reason. So then you can look at yourself from, no, I'm not a weird human being. I'm just in pain and I'm just trying to escape. So what is so painful? This is the next question. If you can address this question and solve it, then you don't need a dependency anymore. All right. And I've seen this so many times. What is so painful that we are escaping from? This is the next natural question, because if you say I'm escaping from something, the next question is, okay, what are we escaping from? If you solve that, then you will solve the real issue going on. So all these guys are awesome men that I've personally talked with participating in the Spartan program, publicly shared their own testimony, their own experience. And I'm very, very confident that all these men, all of these men will never go back to porn again. Or if they ever do, I know that they would be able to get out of that hole very quickly. And the reason for that is because they all went through this process of understanding the real reason that they had to have it. And we'll use some examples here. So I always ask men that I talk to, because I'm a man, I only talk with men. If I was a woman, I would speak to women, right? But this applies to everyone. If porn is not your thing or masturbation is not your thing you're struggling with, just fill in the blanks. It's just an example. So I ask them, what is your primary trigger or why you have this habit? And usually when people start off in this journey and I talk with them, almost everyone says one of these things. They say Instagram, YouTube, anime, books, the gym, et cetera. Seeing things that are triggery or sexual in nature, and therefore I feel triggered and therefore I feel a desire to escape. And so then I ask, okay, so when you're on Instagram, is it always the same that every time you see something that's sexual in nature that you feel triggered? And they're like, well, not really. So every time you go to the gym, do you notice all the attractive people? And they're like, well, Not really. It's like, okay. So that means there's a factor that's different. There's something that's going on in those two instances that causes you to sometimes feel triggered and sometimes not. So what's that factor we're talking about? What we're talking about is more of an emotional state. It's something that's going on before we go there. And that's the loneliness, that's the boredom, that's the anxiety, that's the anger, that's the stress, et cetera. This is the actual trigger that's going on. So we have an external trigger and we have an internal trigger. The internal trigger is the thing that actually causes us the feeling of wanting to escape in the moment, the external trigger is the thing that is secondary. It's the secondary thing that causes us to fundamentally want to escape and to go down that rabbit hole, right? But it's not actually the internal trigger. But most people focus on eliminating the external trigger by locking their phone, getting software that blocks apps and websites. They go to the gym on the off hours early in the morning or late at night when no one's there. That will help to an extent, but it's a band-aid solution, which is why people fail over and over again, it's because they're not addressing the internal trigger, the actual thing going on. But it goes deeper than that. So we got the second emotion. And then the primary emotions are the things that are happening underneath these. Because when I ask guys, it's like, okay, you were lonely when you acted out, you slipped up. So we have the loneliness that I asked them, like, why were you feeling lonely? It's like, oh, because I was all alone. And I didn't feel like there was anyone in my life. And everyone else has got somebody and I don't. And then someone else says, well, I was bored on a Saturday. And I just had nothing to do. And I woke up late and then I just goofed around online, played video games, watched some anime. And then I eventually went to porn. It's like, okay, interesting. So what's going on there? They often express all of these emotions, but underneath these emotions, there's always something else going on. The loneliness that someone feels. It's not just the loneliness. It's like usually in most cases, there's a sense of fear or anxiety that's underneath. Fear of something. 
Like I'm afraid of being alone, for example, afraid of being alone my entire life. So this feeling of loneliness causes a lot of anxiety for me. Like how long will this last? Or people feel bored. What's that? Another guy I was talking with, he wakes up on a Saturday and goofs around online, like I said, and spends a whole day kind of just loathing around and feeling like, oh, I didn't do anything productive today. And I've spent two hours on YouTube and I watch anime and then watch porn. It's like, I'm just a piece of garbage. And we peel that back. It's like, okay, what is the fear you're experiencing? You're actually not bored, but you're actually having fear or anxiety. Like I feel anxious about finances. Why do you feel anxious about finances? Let's think about that for a second. It's like, well, I'm afraid that I'll be homeless. A guy that I was talking with actually felt like I'm afraid of being homeless. Why are you afraid of being homeless? Like, well, I guess I've been raised a certain way. And I feel like if I don't succeed in life and have a good financial future and career, then my parents will be disappointed or somebody will be disappointed. It's like, oh, interesting. So my point is like under all these emotions is almost always you can challenge yourself and think about this the next time you're feeling it. there's some kind of fear going on underneath this. It's like when you're angry at the person in front of you or behind you in the traffic, it's like you just anger or you're reacting to something. Is the anger a response or reaction to something else that's going on? These are examples. If you peel it back enough and understand that a lot of the times I feel these emotions, it's actually fear of something. So fear of what exactly? And this is the exact process that I use with all these guys I'm talking with to figure out what I'm afraid of. And almost every person that has an unwanted behavior, they are running from the fear of being unworthy of grace, the feeling of being unworthy of acceptance. The fear is if someone really saw me, they would be disappointed and disapproving of me. I would be unloved. And this is the fear that drives so much of human behavior. Like you think about this for a second. The last time you were incredibly angry or stressed or anxious or bored or whatever, did you feel unconditionally accepted? Did you feel unconditionally loved and approved of? And no matter what you would do, you would feel like somebody would listen to you and appreciate you. And on the flip side, when you feel filled up by someone and seen and you feel accepted by someone because you just shared something very honest and vulnerable with them and they just love you, in those moments, do you feel a desire to escape? Do you feel a desire to run away, to watch porn, to masturbate. So we did an exercise at the High Noon Workshops. A lot of you guys were there in the subregion workshops. And we did an exercise called Lifting Shame, where we had small groups in private rooms and everybody shared kind of their proudest things in their life, what they're most proud of, and also what they're ashamed of. And it's really important to do those exercises because it's important to understand and feel how you feel when you do that. And so the next day in one of the workshops, I asked them like, how do you guys feel today waking up and after doing the activity? Right after you did that, did you feel like you wanted to run away and escape and be alone and hide under the covers? Maybe some of you did. And that's okay because that's learning and that's understanding. And that's what I'm talking about. It's like learning that and seeing that in ourselves and learning how to address that. So the fear is if someone saw me, then they'd be disappointed, disapproving of me. Feeling unworthy of grace and love is painful, which is why we try to numb that pain with escapism. It's painful. It's a painful reality that we all have to face. And I'm not saying just by the way that nobody loves you. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the perception of I'm not worthy of love is what is painful and is what is detrimental to us, which causes us to want to escape. Because porn masturbation is an easy escape. It's an easy way to numb the pain and to be filled up very temporarily. But escapism never fills us up. It never does. It only gives an artificial feeling of being filled up while leaving us wanting more of it because it never actually fills us up. Have you ever been to like a fast food restaurant. I always pick on McDonald's, but it's just because I sometimes go to McDonald's and I grew up in the 90s. So whenever I go to McDonald's, I get usually two McChickens. I'm like, okay, 500 calories for a McChicken. That's enough for me. I'll just get two of them. It's like, I eat two McChickens. And then before I know it, I'm like, I'm really hungry. I'm still hungry. I'm going to get two more McChickens. And by the time I finish McDonald's, I've eaten four McChickens, 2000 calories and still hungry. <laughs> so it's a kind of a tangential reality and example of what it's like to fill yourself with something artificial that actually doesn't fill you up in the correct and genuine way. Grace is a secret missing ingredient to being filled up all the time, all the time, every day. When you're filled up, you don't need anything else. This is the key. This is the secret. It's not about willing yourself through an unwanted behavior and pushing yourself to a certain milestone or days or whatever. It's addressing the root issue. It's filling yourself up with the real stuff so you don't feel a need to go there anymore. And I promise you, this is what happens when people quit porn, when masturbation and unwanted behaviors long-term. What it actually looks like is they just keep working on the grace and the accountability and the acceptance in their lives and talking with people about these difficult emotions they're feeling. And then they look back in their lives and they realize, man, I haven't thought about porn in like months. What's going on? I haven't even been triggered to escape to my phone or to play video games or do anything that's destructive for me in months or weeks. What's going on? It's because they continue to do the thing, take one step at a time to fill themselves in the right way. And the reason that you keep doing things that are destructive to you or anyone does it's because you're not filling yourself up the right thing. So here's grace in action with real people and real examples. Amir is a guy 
who is crippled with shame. I started talking with him. These are all people in the Spartan program, by the way, the Heinen Spartan program. And his biggest thing was he couldn't talk with anybody about his tab. I was like, can you talk to your parents, mom? And he's like, no, never. He was like, uh -uh. if I tell anyone I'm going to die, like they're going to murder me. That's really how he felt. And I was like, well, you have any friends? He's like, no, I can't. And I was like, well, let's not talk about porn. Let's talk about your emotions. Because that's the thing under the iceberg, right? It's like, let's talk about this feeling wanting to escape. And he's like, I can't even talk about that with anybody. I can't even talk about stress or my emotions with my parents. I was like, okay, interesting. So I told him, I was like, Amir, you can live your entire life in fear of disappointment, or you can incrementally find people in your life that can see you and accept you and love you. That's the only option. Or if you don't do that, you probably will be addicted to something your entire life, something, whether it's porn, whatever. And he was like, okay. So he made it a top priority to do that. And what he did is he found two friends in different Facebook groups in this community that are from different parts of the country. And he made a priority to call them every single day, every day to talk about his emotional states. So here's an example of a guy who has nobody, according to his perception, he has nobody to talk to, riddled with shame. And he's found two friends that are willing to listen to him and to give him grace and acceptance. And guess what? He's doing really well. He hasn't needed porn or masturbation in many months because he addressed the thing that was causing it. He experienced grace. Jim is a guy, he's a first gen, he's 73 years old. He's pretty well known in our church, in our movement. He shared with me that he didn't do anything for a long time because he felt so ashamed of it. Because here's a guy who's a first generation. It's like, we're not supposed to struggle with porn and masturbation, right? And so he said that for him, it was the fundamental thing that was causing him to go back to the habit because the shame is so painful, especially for us guys and gals who are people of high values. It's so painful to have shame and hypocrisy in our life. And what's the easiest way to escape the feeling of shame? More of the same thing that got us there, right? More porn, more masturbation. So he's spiraling out of control. So I was like, all right, Jim, let's address the shame. Let's get rid of that and see how you feel. So I gave him little doses of grace and acceptance and listening. And I said, you know, you made a mistake, maybe, yes. But I hope you're still worthy of grace and acceptance. And changed his life. He hasn't gone back to it ever since. By the way, his wife died this year, just in February. And he came to the program because he was depressed. He didn't know what to do. And guess what? He's 73 years old and he started a new career. He just passed an exam, a certification to become a pharmacy technician or something like that, because that was his North Star. That's it. And I think it's a beautiful testimony of hope and grace and love that he was willing to do the work to get the grace that he needed. Here's Matthew. He's another guy that was in the program. When we were doing our daily check-ins, he had a very hard time understanding his emotion, his emotional state. Like, why do I feel a desire to escape, to watch porn and masturbate? And so every day well, I asked him the questions to try to figure out like, what's going on? Why do you feel this desire to escape? To the point where now he can very quickly identify his emotions and address them before they become an issue. To address them before he has an uncontrollable desire to act out, he cuts them out early before he even gets there. How? He's developed a relationship with his mom and with his friends where he can talk openly about his emotional state, the thing that's causing the symptom, which is a porn habit. And I'm using porn as an example because porn is a symptom of something that's going on, whatever it is that we're struggling with, whether it's social media, video games, anger, violence, drugs, alcohol, masturbation, whatever it is, guys, it's always the same root issue. And that's what we're getting to. But porn is just a very prevalent symptom that's very prevalent in our movement because it's such an easy escape. I'm not going to share her story. That's her story to give. But she has been sharing very openly in all the workshops that we've been doing and online that her experience in our movement was like, she told herself, I'm never going to tell anybody about this because I feel so much shame. I'm never going to tell anybody about this. And guess what? She heard somebody speak openly at a high noon workshop about their own struggles. And then little by little, she started feeling like it's okay to share about this to the point where she could actually be seen and be honest so that she can experience grace and the accountability she needed. And now she's on stage sharing about her experience in front of people openly. How cool is that? Talk about a 180. And there's Watashi. That's me, by the way. My experience <laughs> is very similar to these people. I used porn and masturbation because every time like clockwork, I was stressed in my relationship with my wife, especially early on in our blessing, I would always go to porn because it was the easy escape from the pain and the painful reality of stress in my life and my relationship with my wife. So I had to peel that back and not just blame my wife and say like, oh, it's my wife's fault that I'm angry because she's whatever, whatever. But I peeled back to the place where I understood that my validation and my value as a man, as a husband, was so wrapped up on in our relationship. So every time there was tension, I would feel like, man, I'm a piece of garbage husband. I'm the worst husband in the whole world. And I was wrapped in shame, and wrapped up in this idea that I had to be perfect and awesome all the time. But it was the shame of if someone found out that our relationship isn't awesome, I would be unworthy of grace. If my parents found out that my relationship with my wife is not awesome, if people found out like my life is over because I'm the guy, I was the BFM guy. I was the guy that had my acts together and it was a shame that was causing it. 
until I started talking openly about people and receiving the grace. And people said, hey, yeah, you made mistakes. It doesn't mean you're any less worthy of love. It changed my life. And as soon as I started widening my support system to be able to talk to people about the core issues, which is my stress, then I started to resolve it. And this is why I tell all these people, it's like, you don't have to talk about porn to beat porn. You don't have to talk about porn to beat porn. You don't have to talk about the symptom to beat the root issue, to address the root issue. Yes, there are people that should know about it. But if you just focus on talking about the symptom, you're not actually addressing the root issue and you're actually masking and trivializing the thing that's going on. So the best kind of accountability relationship you can develop is not, hey, wife, or hey, mom, hey, dad, I'm really triggered to watch porn. I'm at the edge of the cliff about to act out. That's not an effective use of a relationship or accountability relationship. The most effective way to use an accountability partner is actually to address the root issues before you get to the edge of the cliff. It's by talking about, hey, mom, hey, dad, I'm really stressed today. And I know that I don't manage stress well because I usually just go in my room and I just spend hours on YouTube and play video games. And I really don't want to do that anymore. I think it's really destructive for me because I'm not learning how to address my emotions. And when you do that and you share it with the right people that give you the grace and the acceptance, I promise you the feeling of I want to escape will disappear. It will vanish. And it's just that it is so easy to escape nowadays. It's so easy to whip out a phone. It's so easy to just go in a room and just want to be alone. But it starts there. It starts with, I just want to be alone and goof around online or whatever. And it ends with the most destructive forms of escapism you can imagine. Porn, alcoholism, drugs, et cetera, anger, violence. That's where it ends. But it starts with, I just want to be alone. I don't want to see anyone right now. I'm really stressed. It's addressing though. And let me remind you guys, it's not bad to feel emotion. It's not bad to be stressed. It's not. It's not bad to be anxious. It's not bad to be bored at all. It is bad when you link an emotion with some kind of escapism or some kind of supernormal stimuli that takes you out of that emotion to a very temporary state. And that's what I did for a long time until I realized I got to address the root issue. So here's some new perspectives just to wrap up that I want to offer you guys. Managing internal triggers is more effective than reducing external triggers. Managing internal triggers is infinitely more effective than reducing external triggers. And as long as you only address the external triggers, you're actually never going to heal because abstinence is different from recovery. Abstinence is just pushing yourself through a habit. Recovery is addressing the root issue so that you don't need the behavior anymore. Here's another perspective. You don't have a porn problem. You have an escapism problem. Think about that for a second. Now, this is really important and helpful for people because it does eliminate the shame that's associated with it. It's not that you have a porn problem. Porn problem is part of the issue. The real issue, the bigger issue is you have an escapism problem. That's it. That's all that's going on. Another perspective, the real under the iceberg reason we do things we don't want to do is because it's easy to escape from pain. And the pain is the fear of unworthiness, the fear of I'm not worthy of grace. I'm not worthy of acceptance, which is a very painful feeling to experience. The solution to the fear of unworthiness is the secret ingredient. It's great. The solution is grace. So some question you might have, how can I change my behavior to prioritize grace? Hopefully it's made you feel like, wow, grace is actually something that I want to prioritize in my life and experience on a regular basis. If that's you, then here's my solution for you. Step one is recognize the negative impact of not prioritizing grace. This is incredibly effective for changing any type of behavior, any type of behavior at all. This is proven to be very effective. The first thing is recognizing the negative impact of not having that or doing that behavior. So you can think about that maybe as an activity, like what has not prioritizing grace in my life? How is it affecting? Because the reality is probably you have not thought about grace in a long time. Probably it's not something that you actively try to seek out every day. If it's not something you actively try to seek out, then it's time to do that. The fastest way to do that is understand how it's negatively impacting you by not having it. Step two is to disprove to yourself the belief that I can live without daily grace. It's a little bit nuanced, but it's an important thing. Because the reality is that if you have not found that grace is something that's important to you, then the reality is that you have an underlying thought subconsciously or consciously that grace is not that important and I can live just fine without making a priority. So you have to disprove to yourself that that belief is not true. And you can do that by looking at this and also talking with people and hearing testimonies of people that have experienced grace. And that's why I shared some of the testimonies just before. Another question, how do I actually get grace regularly? Simple answer, find a way to share honestly with one person every day about your internal state, your emotions. That's it. If you can do this one thing, guys, it will drastically change your life. I guarantee it. And I want you guys to tell me, try this every day for a week and let me know how it affected you. And I promise you, it's really, really going to radically change things for you, especially if you have some kind of unwanted behavior. So here's a challenge for you guys. If you had to connect with someone every day, how would you do it? Now, this is the hardest part about recovery is that most of us feel like we don't have people because we are tend to be isolated. Let me remind you guys, it's not about talking about the symptom. 
the porn, the masturbation, the whatever it is, it's talking about the emotions, the things that lead us to want to escape. So if you had to, because your life depended on it, let's say your doctor prescribed it to you, how would you do it every single day if you had to? And be creative and stretch your imagination to think, how can I do this if I absolutely had to do it? So example is, hey, mom, dad, wife, brother, husband, whoever, today I'm feeling really stressed. I just want to be alone and watch YouTube or play video games. Just wanted to tell you because I'm trying to manage stress better instead of escaping emotion. This, my friends, is called beating porn without talking about porn. This is beating masturbation without talking about masturbation, anything without talking about it. Like I said, just as a caveat, it's important that people know about your habit, such as parents, spouse, and also high noon, but it doesn't mean that you have to tell everybody to beat it. It's an option. So here's, again, that challenge. If I had to connect with someone every day, how would you do it? All right. Thank you, guys. Love you all. Lots of grace to you. 